Hello learners, my name is Bhagya Lakshmi. Today we are going to learn about the chapter an overview of Indian economy. In this chapter you will learn the state of Indian economy at the time of independence which is resulted out of 200 years of British rule, the changes in the features of Indian economy after achieving independence and the economic reforms. Now, first of all, we can understand what was the condition of Indian economy at the time of independence. India inherited the economy from the British who were ruling this country for their gain. The British were never interested in the development of India or its citizens. Their aim was to exploit the resources of India and take away as much as possible to England. Even if the construction of railways was a positive contribution. It was mostly used to serve the British interest. And some of the important features of India at the time of independence was the decline of handicrafts industry, the production of cash crops, famines and food shortage, rise of intermediaries in agriculture. First of all, we can understand how far the decline of handicraft industry affected Indian economy. You know, handicraft industry was one of the flourishing industry in India at the time of British rule. Before the coming of Britishers, the emperors and kings promoted the interest of local artisans, weavers and carpenters. And because of that, the Indian handicraft industry flourished a lot. The Indian handicraft industry, the Indian artisans were very good in beautiful paintings, designing jewellery, designing textiles, decorating walls, making furnitures, tailoring, etc. But when the British came, they systematically destroyed the handicraft industry. They defeated the kings, they took away their kingdom and the towns were destroyed. All of this resulted in the destruction of the handicraft industry. As an activity, you can go to a museum and find out about the handicrafts of those days. Secondly, the production of cash crops. The second important effect of British rule in India was the production of cash crops. England was undergoing change in terms of industrialization. The factories in Britain needed raw materials and to make the textiles, raw cotton was required. For this, they promoted the growth of cash crops in India. So, the production of cash crops was another important feature of Indian economy at the time of independence. Indigo was in high demand to make prints on textiles. Indigo, cotton, etc. were promoted the farmers were forced to grow these cash crops for the benefit of the Britishers. Attracted by the money, the Indian farmers grew all these cash crops for the British who supplied them to factories in England. So that is the second important aspect of Indian economy at the time of independence. The factory made goods were sent for sale in the Indian market. Now, the British sold these goods to Indian people and made profit. So, you can see that the raw materials were produced in India, which were exported to Britain. And then, in Britain, these goods were transformed into finished goods and the goods again came back to India to sell off in the Indian markets. In both ways, the British made huge profit. And the third important aspect of Indian economy at the time of independence was the famines and the shortage of food. The worst, one of the most important part of British rule in India was the frequently occurring famines. Now, what are famines? Famines are a situation where the many people, they don't get food to eat and they die of hunger and diseases. Many people used to die of famine during the British rule. 
the famous Bengal famine is a very good example of the bad face of British rule in India. Now we can examine what are the reasons for the occurrence of famines in our country. The most important reason for famines in our country during the British rule was that the agriculture was dependent on rainfall. There was bad rainfall. The bad rainfall upset the food grain production. The irrigation facilities were not available. So in short, the bad rainfall without irrigation facilities resulted in bad crops. So that was one of the reasons for the occurrence of famines. Another important reason for the occurrence of famines is that the British government kept on exporting food grains to its native country England and elsewhere even if there was local need for these things. The food grains were in great demand in India but these were not available in India. Why? The British used to export all these food grains to Britain and to other countries of Europe. That resulted in the shortage for food grains in India. Another important reason we can here again find out for the reason for famines was the British government was interested in earning revenue through the export of food grains to Britain and to other countries. So the policy of the British was the reason, main reason for the frequently occurring famines of our country. Then the British were sending food from India to these countries where their soldiers were fighting to capture territories. This was also another reason for the frequently occurring famines in India. The Britain was fighting war in many other countries of Asia and Africa. So the British frequently used to send food grains and other essential goods to these countries for the soldiers who were fighting there. This also resulted in the shortage of food grains in India. The poor people in our country had not enough money to purchase food grains from the market. So this all resulted into the in the frequently occurring famines in our country. The Indian farmers were encouraged to produce cash crops on their fields. This led to the fall in the production of food grains because less area was available for their cultivation. More and more areas of land was under the cultivation of cash crops that resulted in the decrease in the area of cultivation of food crops. This also led to decrease in food grain production. Then another important factor which contributed to the destruction of agriculture in India was the emergence of intermediaries. Agriculture was a major occupation of people of India during the British rule. You know that 70% more than 70% of the population was dependent on agriculture. It was a major source of revenue for the government. And the British introduced two types of land revenue system during their rule. One was permanent settlement under which the land revenue to be collected was permanently fixed. The second system was the temporary settlement under which the land revenue was changed after 25 to 30 years of time. So there were three important types of land settlement. There were three important types of intermediaries during the British rule. One of the important intermediary in eastern parts of India were zamindars. The intermediaries were known as zamindars in the eastern part of India. In the western part of India, the intermediaries were known as mahalwars. And in the southern part of India, the intermediaries were known as riot wars. So we can find there were three important types of land settlement in India during the British rule. Zamindari system, Mahalwari system and Riotwari system. The British appointed these intermediaries in order to collect the land revenue from the farmers. So we can see, see that there were Zamindars, Mahalwars and Riotwars. All of them were the intermediaries of land revenue collection during the British rule. You can find the pictures enclosed about Zamindars.
during the British rule. This intermediaries, they act between the British government and the common people. What was their job? Their job was to collect revenue in the form of rent, tax, etc. from the villagers, farmers and other households and submit that revenue with the government. During the British rule, the railways were introduced. One of the positive impact of British rule in India was the introduction of railway. The railways were first introduced by the British in the year 1853 between Bombay and Thane. Between 1850 and 1855, the first jute mill, the first cotton mill and the first coal mine, all of them were established. The British government also set up telecommunication, telegraph, post offices in the country. So all of them you can point out as the positive impact of British rule in India. Now we look on the changes in the features of Indian economy after independence. After independence, a new era began in the history of India after independence. Unlike the British government, the aim of the government of India was to take India towards the higher levels of development and achieve welfare for all its citizens. By the year 2010, the government of India has completed more than 60 years of governing India. Now, we can understand the Indian economy after independence through the points. The level of per capita income, the growth rate of per capita income, heavy population pressure, existence of poverty, dependence on agriculture, planning for development. Now what is per capita income? Per capita income is the income per head of population. It is calculated by dividing the national income by population. Income of an individual is a major indicator of his or her standard of living. Per capita income gives the idea of income earned on an average by an individual in the economy in a year. It shows the standard of living of the people in the country. We can have a statistics of per capita income now. India's per capita income for the year 2009-10 was rupees 33,731. This comes out to be around rupees 2811 per month. This per capita income of India is not only low but also growing very slowly. The growth rate of per capita income refers to growth rate of income over the different years. Now, why we want our income to increase every year? First of all, our wants are increasing as we grow over time. In order to satisfy the extra wants, we need more income. Secondly, another reason for earning more income is that the prices of goods that we buy in the market are also increasing. So, you may have to pay more money for the same goods and services you consume. We can see the table. In the year 2008-9, per capita income was 31,801. Again, in the year 2009-10, the per capita income increased to 33,731. That means there was a growth in the per capita income. The second aspect of Indian economy after independence is the heavy population pressure. Indian economy, you know, it's overpopulated. It is the second most populated country in the world. It has grown by more than three times in almost 60 years. At the time of independence in 1947, the population was 350 million. According to 2011 census, India's population stands at 1.21 billion. It is second only to China in the world and may even overtake China in future. Why we are worried about high population? That's a very important question to answer. Why? Because if there is more population, we require more food, 
more clothes and we need more income because our expenditure also increases very highly. We need to construct more houses. We need to construct more roads. We will have to construct more schools. We will have to construct more hospitals for providing health services. We can have a data regarding the population of India as per census 2011. Uttar Pradesh, the population has grown by 19 percentage, Maharashtra 11.2 percentage and the total population of India is 121 million. We can compare it with the other countries. Brazil has the total population of 19.07 million, Mexico 11.2 million, whereas India is having 121 million. The fourth important aspect of Indian economy after independence is the existence of poverty. Not only that India is overpopulated, but also India is very much poor. Nearly one third of world's poor live in our country. We can find children working in dabas, children working on the field. We can see slums in the towns and cities. We can find beggars on the streets. All this points out to the existence of poverty in the country. We can see the visuals of poverty in our country day to day basis. More than 30 crores of India's population suffer from poverty, which is about 27.5% of the total population. Out of this, more than 22 crores live in rural areas. The rest of them live in urban areas, that is in towns and cities. Now, we can uh, understand the poverty situation in some of the states of our country. What is the percentage of poor in different states of India. Odisha is the state having the largest percentage of poor people with 46 percentage of the total population poor. Punjab is the state having the least poverty ratio, 8 percentage. You can see state by state the percentage of poor people, statistics regarding the percentage of poor people in India. How does poverty occur? Poverty occurs due to, first of all, a person affected by poverty is either unemployed or earn very small amount of income from his or her current occupation, which is insufficient to fulfill his or her basic need. That means the first foremost reason for poverty is unemployment. The second reason for poverty is that exploitation. The person must be subjected to exploitation by others on the basis of caste or religion or gender. Thirdly, we can also say the person has become poor because he or she has not got any property in the form of land or house. Those who have inherited property from their ancestors enjoy certain advantages over others who do not have property. So that can also be said as reason for poverty. Fourth, perhaps the efforts of the government have not been effective. Corruption and slow pace of decision making in government are obstacles in removing poverty. However, existence of poverty is not the failure of the government alone, but also failure of the people and the society at large who should help each other and cooperate so that everyone can lead a decent life. The fifth important aspect of Indian economy after independence is the dependence on agriculture. In an economy, people pursue various activities to earn their livelihood, such as agriculture, industry, services, etc. Indian economy has been traditionally based on agriculture. Indian economy is known as an agrarian economy. In 1951, at the beginning of the first plan, more than 70% of the population were engaged in agriculture and related activities. Even if this has come down, still around 60% of the population is dependent on agriculture 
at the beginning of the 21st century that is the year 2001. Another important aspect of Indian economy is the planning for development. A major feature of Indian economy after independence has been its consistent effort to achieve development through the process of economic planning. This is a very positive phenomena going on for the past 60 years. I will make you remember the Planning Commission of India was set up in the year 1950 and we started the planned development of our Indian economy from the year 1951. So far, we have completed 11 five-year plans and the 12th five-year plan is in progress. It will come to an end on 31st March 2017. And you can here have a data about the plan periods. Starting from 1951, we had so far completed 11 five-year plans till 2012. And in between, we had five annual plans. Three annual plans were there between 1966 and 1969. And two annual plans were there between 1990 and 1992. So far, 11 five-year plans are complete. How the government allocate expenditure on plans? In each and every plan, the government allocates resources to various areas such as agriculture, industry, education, health, transport and communication, community development and other social sectors. The aim is to use the given resources earmarked for the said area for its development as per the target fixed by the government for the said period. For example, the resources for agriculture can be used for improving productivity of land, extending irrigation facilities, etc. Similarly, the resources for education can be used for construction of school buildings, granting scholarships to meritorious students, etc. and so on. So, what you have learned so far? You learned about the state of Indian economy at the time of independence, which has resulted out of 200 years of British rule, the changes in the features of Indian economy after achieving independence, and also we understood about the economic reforms. So that's all in this chapter. Thank you and have a great day.